modern day young earth creationism is causing people to become atheists. I know that sounds shocking, maybe even absurd for some people. First off, I'm a Christian. I'm not trying to show you why you should be an atheist. I think there's great evidence for Christianity. I'm also not trying to prove evolution or an old earth. I don't really care about which one is right. With that being said, there are people who call themselves Christians and yet don't seem to care about truth all that much and what does is push thousands of people to become atheists. In this video, I'm going to show you how that happens. We're going to look at parts of two videos. One video is a video made by the biggest apologetics organization in the world, Answers in Genesis, headed by Ken Ham, claiming that evolutionists are lying for their agenda, while also exposing the absurd lack of scientific evidence for evolution. And then another channel ran by the evolutionary scientist Guts Gibbon, who repeatedly points out various times where the Young Earth Creationist video consistently leaves out important information and oftentimes just gets facts flat out wrong. Oh, and one last thought, I'm not here to tell you not to look at Young Earth Creationism. If you want to see better, more honest arguments for Young Earth Creationism, check out videos from Todd Wood or Marcus Ross. Also, I'm going to use the word evidence a lot. Note that I define evidence as anything that raises the probability of a given proposition, and that under that definition of evidence, there can be evidence for both evolution and young earth creationism. Let's get into the actual videos. In the video by Answers in Genesis, we have someone who basically gives a list of what the maker considers to be the problems with the evidence given for human evolution. The video starts out with, From its inception, the scientific proofs offered to support human evolution have been riddled with holes. In fact, just like the dubious sideshow examples touted by circus shysters, many of the earliest proofs were fraudulent. And modern research shows that many proofs were driven by scientific ignorance and evolutionary interpretations. From its inception, the arguments for evolution have been riddled with holes. What is the layperson going to think this means? Well, naturally, the layperson who's watching is going to think, hey, you know, the writer thinks the evidence for human evolution has had all kinds of issues. How the author shows this is a different question as they go through a list of what the author sees as essentially arguments that have been used for human evolution. And the author is going to not only debunk the arguments, but make them look silly, along with pointing out all the other times where evolutionists throughout history have pointed to old fossils and bones as evidence for human evolution. But it turns out many of them were actually fakes, or now known to be proven wrong. It might be disappointing to some that I'm not going to show you each one of the items that the Young Earth Creationist Maker decided to list. The reason I won't is because it doesn't matter. Because that's not how evidence works. See, you can't pick and choose the very worst evidence for something, debunk that, and then say, oh, there's no evidence for evolution. Evolution must be absurd. A similar example is how some people do things like look at the clouds and say, oh, I see a cross, and therefore conclude Christianity must be true. If an atheist were to come along and point out all the situations where people believe in Christianity based off of the shape of clouds or a random sail in the body. And then the atheist says, there must be no evidence for God because everyone who believes things like this are stupid. Would we say the atheist is thinking critically? No. Likewise, to think that all of the evidence for human evolution is absurd based off what was chosen in this video is completely ridiculous. Over 99% of scientists today believe in evolution. Do you see any of them pointing to what we see as known frauds as reason to believe in evolution? Obviously not. And what does the layman, young earth creationist, conclude after watching this video? Well, it's reasonable to conclude that such a big organization with a lot of resources would have the ability to know what is commonly used for evidence of human evolution. And therefore, when a layman sees a title which says, exposing the absurd lack of scientific evidence for evolution, well, that implies that the video is going to include all of the made evidence for evolution and why it's absurd. Go watch the video. What do you see? 
basically what we see from mainstream evolutionists of what is commonly proposed as scientific evidence for evolution, human evolution. Well, basically none of that is interacted with in this video. Instead, it's a list of things nobody would use as evidence along with huge misrepresentations of the ones that are used as evidence while completely ignoring the long list of other bones used as evidence for evolution. All of this to portray evolutionists as biased, immoral liars? Okay, well let's just say the people that made the title didn't actually make the video, okay? We'll just ignore the extremely toxic misrepresentation of a title and say the goal of the video wasn't actually to portray this as all of the evidence. Maybe this is just to argue that there's a pattern of misleading evidence. Okay, so what? There is an even longer list of Christians who have made fake evidence for young earth creationism, of which organizations like Answers in Genesis have publicly denounced. We obviously aren't going to say, oh, there is a pattern of misleading evidence among young earth creationists, as if all Christians do that. Just like all Christians don't fake things, all evolutionists don't fake things. We should consider each point, point by point, of what people claim, use that as the evidence, and not some list of hoaxes that nobody even cares about anymore. Anyways, while I don't want to make this a nerdy science video, there are a number of occasions where the young earth creationist simply gets the facts wrong, misrepresents the position of the scientific community, and completely ignores important bones, and then when he actually includes a couple of them, he doesn't actually interact with the evidence. Much as how the carnivals cycled through the unfortunate ape men performers of the past, a whole slew of proposed human ancestors have come and gone over the years as a carousel of caveman candidates have been proposed, debunked, reassigned, or removed from the forefront of human evolutionary thought. Before this, he's only mentioned two times where things have truly been debunked. Then in this video, he goes on to act like there's a long list of times where things have been debunked or seen as frauds, when obviously he's only mentioned two of them. Gets it Gibbon rightly points out the misrepresentation. Oh yeah, Calvin? Like, like which ones would you say? Outside of Nebraska Man and Piltdown Man, I can't think of a single example of a hominid being debunked. Or removed, now that I think about it, reassigned in its position on the hominid family tree? Yeah, sure. He then goes on to name different names of bones, which were supposedly originally seen as evidence, but supposedly now aren't. Well, I mean, that's factually incorrect. Cro-Magnon, Peking Man, Java Man, Ramapithecus. All of these were once shouted from the proverbial rooftops in both popular news articles and serious scientific publications as proof of evolution, only to later lose favor among the more progressive evolutionary community. Also, can you appreciate how he just presents the colloquial names for a lot of these fossil specimens and does not elaborate at all on anyone? He's just like, these are some examples of evolutionary icons that have come and gone, lost in the rain. So let's consider those for a moment and assess them for their current position in paleoanthropology, something I can speak to since I'm now starting my third year as a PhD student in biological anthropology. First, Cro-Magnon man. This is the colloquial name given to specimens of Homo sapiens from Europe, specifically late Homo sapiens specimens from Europe. They're still just a part of the human evolution story. They're just not called Cro-Magnon anymore. They're called like middle to late Homo sapiens. Then you have Peking man. This is just still Homo erectus. No one thinks that Peking man was not Homo erectus or that Homo erectus as a species has gone by the wayside. In fact, it is like the biggest category of hominin out there, especially when you're looking at it in its sensu leto sense. Same thing with Java man. These are the trinal material. This is the trinal material, the trinal specimens. Still Homo erectus, still a foundation within human evolution because these were some of the first fossils found. And lastly, Ramapithecus is interesting because this was another mistake, but it didn't actually invalidate any of the fossils. So what they show on the screen there is actually the face of Shivapithecus, a currently accepted hominid and potentially one of the ancestors of modern day orangutans. Now, initially there were two species. There was Ramapithecus and Shivapithecus. But what we've come to find out about these specimens is that Ramapithecus is just 
female Shiva pithecus. They're the same species, but it's a sexually dimorphic species. After naming bones of Homo erectus as supposedly not used anymore as evidence, he literally says that Homo erectus is currently used as evidence. Currently popular candidates such as Homo erectus are not faring much better under scrutiny. I mean, you guys, 50%, two of the four of these abandoned evolutionary icons that Calvin just got done listing aloud are members of Homo erectus. Is a currently popular candidate, but also it's fallen by the wayside. The speaker makes a point that the brain size of Homo erectus is smaller than most people today, and then notes that there are still some people that have the brain size Homo erectus has, therefore implying that the smaller brain size isn't an issue. Of course, that conveniently ignores how the brain size is evidence of a traditional form. It is obviously unexpected to find a human brain all the way back then, which would be extremely small for today, and therefore it is evidence for human evolution. And just by this fact alone, it still could possibly just be human, but that doesn't mean that we can ignore the obvious inference that needs to be made that it's unexpected and therefore evidence for human evolution. Although smaller than the average human is today, the brain size is within the range of modern people. And it's also within the range of Australopithecus. What do you call something that spans the range between a previously existing species and a currently existing species? Something that perhaps is transitioning from the former to the latter. He then conveniently never mentions other similarities, which Erica points out for us. Homo erectus overlaps with Australopithecus, which these guys say is just an ape in brain case size, prognathism, tooth size, stature, basically any characteristic that Homo erectus overlaps with modern humans in, it also overlaps with Australopithecus in. And when you think about it, if Homo erectus is just a human, then doesn't that make Australopithecus just a human too? Later, the young earth creationist makes a claim, which is completely false, and then avoids mentioning more evidence. And studies of the middle ear have shown that Homo erectus walked just as we do. There's nothing about their skeletons that fall outside of the normal human range. Okay, so for that last part, we know that's just brutally untrue. Homo erectus specimens do fall outside of the human range. The upper end of Homo erectus can overlap with the lower end of modern humans, and the lower end of Homo erectus can overlap with the upper end of Australopithecus and early genus Homo. Things that, again, creationists would consider, like, distinctly not human. But also, we know that Homo erectus was bipedal not because of its inner ear morphology, but because of the morphology of the rest of the entire skeleton. The anterior foramen magnum with a forward position, the bull-shaped pelvis with sagittally oriented iliac blades, the morphology of the foot, and of course the valgus knee. Characteristics, by the way, that Australopithecus also has. After mentioning a list of popular names, the young earth creationist mentions Lucy as if that's the last bit of evidence for human evolutionists, coincidentally also not mentioning that it's not even the best evidence for human evolution. However, there's still one very popular contender often discussed, the famous fossil find called Lucy. Okay, so Calvin has discussed four icons that have gone by the wayside, early Homo sapiens, a Miocene ape that is still very valid, and two specimens of Homo erectus, as compared to still existing icons, Homo erectus and Australopithecus afarensis, or Lucy. Lucy being the last popular icon. I think you missed a few there, Calvin. Like Sailanthropus tudensis, Aurorin tugenensis, Artipithecus cadaba, Artipithecus rabidus, Australopithecus anamensis, Australopithecus barogazali, Australopithecus garhi, Australopithecus diarmida, Australopithecus africanus, Australopithecus prometheus, Australopithecus sediba, Homo habilis, Homo rudolfensis, early versions of Homo erectus, which we sometimes call Homo georgicus, and Homo ergaster, Homo heidelbergensis, Homo rhodesiensis, Denisovans, Homo floresiensis, Homo naledi. I just think you might be missing a couple pieces of the puzzle. I think it's fine to say Lucy is one of the most well-known examples. She's a pretty popular fossil specimen, but she's certainly not the only good fossil specimen that we have of genus Australopithecus. In fact, we have several that are significantly better. He then talks about how Lucy is actually only 
44% complete, as if that means we are wildly clueless about what the other part would have looked like. You see, many laypersons likely imagine that specimens like Lucy were found in a heap and carefully retrieved as a somewhat articulated skeleton that clearly shows these ape-like hominids in similar form to how their reconstructions are shown in books and museum replicas. However, her skeleton is only 40% complete. Don't let creationists convince you that finding fossils in full articulation would change their minds because we have that in Australopithecus sediba, a ridiculously complete skeleton that creationists just never talk about really because it does have articulated portions that show us that yes, it's an Australopith and yes, it was also bipedal and looked very similar to Lucy in many ways. So they will not be convinced by articulated skeletons. Either. I also want to point out, as I tr like to try to do, that when it comes to the completeness of a skeleton, what's being reported is the full completeness of the skeleton based off of the number of skeletal elements. What creationists also never bring up is the fact that Lucy, like us, like all mammals, to my understanding, is bilaterally symmetric. So if you have one side, you have the other. You just simply mirror the image. So when you take that into consideration, we actually have significantly more than 40% of the skeleton and have a very good idea as to what this specimen looked like. But then again, we also have just a ton more specimens of Australopithecus, the genus, and thus know very well what it looked like. We even have like full skulls of the thing. Um, and I've talked about that before as well. After making arguments based off of the presumption that the ones mentioned so far is the only evidence we have, he then mentions other sets of bones which would have affected the previous arguments. Regarding the mention of these new bones, of which he doesn't go in detail at all, he argues that they and bones like Lucy's were clearly ones made for climbing on trees like apes, and not human bones made for walking, of which he literally gives no evidence for. One of the biggest arguments used for human evolution, he doesn't even mention, and rather goes the opposite direction and makes the claim with zero evidence or reason behind it. And scientists have since found other, more complete skeletons of such Australopithecines, which do include hand and feet bones. And from them, we can make a safe guess that Lucy's hands had long, curved fingers suited for climbing in trees, and that Lucy's feet had opposable toes seen in the hand-like feet of apes that could easily grab and climb. She didn't have human-like feet. Yeah, so this is just, again, brutally incorrect, and I find it extremely hard to believe that you could say what Calvin just said after having laid eyes on a single additional Australopith skeleton. We already talked about how Australopiths had curved phalanges that would have allowed them to still be quite good at climbing, but the thing is, is curved phalanges don't preclude a bipedal locomotion when on the ground, but the bipedal morphologies do preclude a quadrupedal locomotion style. He shows a picture of Australopithecus sediba as far as one of the other fossils that we found, and then he just doesn't show STW-573 at all. But it doesn't really matter because both of those fossils, as well as the Dikika child and others, tell us that Australopithecus's feet did in fact look like those of humans in that they had an inline halix and three arches in the foot. Additionally, Erica points out how he ignored more evidence for human evolution. Detailed studies of the inner ears, skulls, and bones suggest that Lucy and her like were not in fact transitioning to human anytime soon. Ah uh, yes, the three things that hominin paleontologists focus on, the inner ear, the skull, and the bones. Australopithecus had inner ears that would have allowed it to still be quite good in the trees, again, matching what we see in the hands, but you notice he just doesn't talk about any of the morphology that indicates and in fact necessitates bipedality. He just completely skips on the foramen magnum, despite showing it in the video, skips the pelvis, skips the valgus knees, skips the feet, other than saying that for one of the specimens of Australopithecus, Lucy, we didn't have feet for. It, yeah, but we, we had feet for others, as you mentioned, and then just kind of lied about, I guess. We have more missing links than we know what to do with, and that's why he chooses to not go over any of them in this video. He makes passing comments about some, showing a picture of them on the screen, but the only Australopith that he actually talks about is Lucy, and he ignores the pertinent morphology that tells us it was bipedal and quote-unquote transitional. Remember that my goal here isn't to give evidence for evolution. 
I don't care which one's right. And I think there's evidence for young earth creationism as well. I digress. A video like this one by Answers in Genesis is destructive for Christianity, and it's certainly not the first time I've come across something like this. People like Gutsy Gibbon or, or the Christian scientist Joel Duff have made countless videos which show how this is a common occurrence. Some other examples you can check out is my interview with Young Earth creationist Marcus Ross on how Answers in Genesis misrepresents other Young Earth creationists that they don't like. Then there's the video where Answers in Genesis has vacation Bible schools which completely misrepresent the data to small children. Or there's the topic of how Answers in Genesis is oblivious to the actual evidence on the topic of Egyptian chronology and how it contradicts the idea of a global flood. I can give an endless amount of quotations where young earth creationists have earned a reputation of being liars. Here's one. Like, what do you call it when someone knowingly spreads misinformation? And what do you call it when that misinformation is purposefully trying to promote a certain ideology or agenda, perhaps? Well, you would call it lying for an agenda, wouldn't you? Do I think they are? No, I think 99% of the time, young earth creationists are just being genuine. But to someone that isn't as familiar with how and why people lie, young earth creationists appear to look like a bunch of liars. Think, what does this do to someone who used to put a huge amount of trust in young earth creationist leaders? What does it do when the most important people in your life are seen as liars or just uneducated. This is extremely harmful because people like Ken Ham have been preaching for years that young earth creationism is the only logical position. And I believe that every time evolution's taught, it undermines the whole message of the cross. For decades, young earth creationists have been going to churches, vacation Bible schools, and private Christian schools to get the word out to Christians all across the USA. At these events, nearly all attendees are not educated on the topic of Genesis. Many are children who don't know any better. And yet, here comes people like Ken Ham, who portray it as ridiculous, maybe even immoral, to be Christian and evolutionist. Let's take a look at Ken Ham's first book, The Lie, Evolution, which has had a number of different covers over the years. In this one, we have the globe of the earth in the shape of the apple, which has been bitten off of. Right under it, we see the lie, evolution. Or look at this one. We even have the serpent of the garden of Eden with an apple, which literally has the word evolution on it. What kind of subliminal messaging does this give people? The obvious association people will make is that evolution is equivalent to the very first sin by Adam and Eve, where humankind first obeyed God, thereby cursing the human race. Let's take a look at this famous picture. We have all of what is seen as the very worst sins on the left side with the foundation of it as evolution. Well, on the right side, it is a battle with young earth creationism where the question is if man decides truth or if God's word decides truth. There is a heavy association with evolution and all the world's problems competing against God's word. You might say, well, this isn't the actual point that the writers of these photos are making. And that's fine. I actually agree. The point isn't what they're actually saying, but what the countless photos and speeches and presentations imply, which is that there is only two options. You be an evolutionist, deny God, live in sin, or be a young earth creationist. And note that there are tons of people who actually think you can't be a Christian and believe in evolution. Now question, what should we expect to happen when someone realizes that there's a long list of videos like the one we watched earlier where young earth creationists horribly misrepresent the evidence. Or when our kids go to college and realize evolution isn't what we were made to believe. It gets worse. Think of how big an organization like Answers in Genesis is. They have every resource available to them. They can get the very best young earth creationist scientists, and yet they often produce content which makes extremely basic mistakes. What is the obvious question someone who's struggling with doubts will ask? They will ask, if someone as big as Answers in Genesis is able to make such basic errors, what does that say about young earth creationism in general? And if the only two choices are young earth creationism and atheism, well, 
That seems like an easy choice in that case, doesn't it? That is the first reason this is so dangerous. There is one more consequence to all of this. While it's rarely ever one thing that deconverts people, it is always one thing that gets the ball rolling. See, it's doubtful that someone would watch this young earth creationist video and immediately go, wow, Christianity must be false. But what it does is it puts people in a place which dramatically hurts one's ability to think critically. See, once one realizes that one's favorite reasons to believe in young earth creationism are not only bad reasons from a logical standpoint, but the people making the claims just happen to very often engage what looks like dishonesty, it's no wonder that people might ask, hmm, if that's wrong, what else have I been deceived or lied to about? For people in this situation, that's not an easy question to ask. Think to yourself, if one's entire purpose of life, all of one's friends and family are built on being a Christian, and you have major doubts about something you thought for certain was true, which is young earth creationism, and you conclude you were lied to, or at the very best, terribly misinformed, that's a very scary place to be. Add in that, that you've thought your entire life that atheism or young earth creationism are the only reasonable two options. Question for you, how do humans typically act when they are scared? You get anxiety, stress, heart rate goes up, not only that, but you aren't able to think very critically. Your mind is thinking, ah, I gotta get out of here. Sure, when we are in fight or flight mode, we can make some rational thoughts, but for most people, it severely inhibits our ability to think critically. So what does that actually look like? Well, if we think we've been lied to about something, we try to find out all the other places we've been possibly lied to. If you go to your fellow Young Earth creationists and they actually are okay with talking about doubts, which many won't do, well, most of them are probably most familiar with the same responses that you have an issue with. Since Answers in Genesis is the biggest apologetics organization, most people are only going to be familiar with Answers in Genesis, so they will naturally point you to an Answers in Genesis video, which has the exact same issues that got you in this mess. So we look to other people. We go to our friendly neighborhood atheists because they will know where the lies are, where the deceit is. Normally, when we have a clear mind, we do better at seeing what is a good and bad argument. But we can't have a clear mind when we're scared or doubting or stressed. Our heart is racing. It feels like the end of the world. We're about to lose Christianity if we don't find a good way to figure out these problems, figure out the lies that we've been told. Everything rides on this. If we stay with Christianity, we risk believing something that we might not actually believe. If we leave Christianity, we risk being sent to an infinite punishment of the scolding hot pits of hell. And that's how the logic goes, is we, we can't think clearly, we look at other arguments against Christianity. In reality, we might not have been wrong about that. But when we can't think clearly, we have a hard time rationalizing what is right and wrong. And therefore, we see a lot of non-Christians going from some type of fundamentalist Christianity all the way to, like, on the very edge of atheism, where a lot of times the people in these situations... They're not able to think clearly, so they go off to these crazy beliefs that really aren't based on fact. But the thing is, that appears more true to them compared to listening to all the lies they've been told as a child. So what do people do when they can't think clearly, they think they've been lied to their entire lives? Well, when everything has fallen apart, everything they used to believe in, everything, it looks like a lie. Well, the next step is just, it naturally is to leave Christianity. I come across people like this almost on the daily. I mean, nearly every YouTube atheist video mentions this as a reason for their deconversion. Ken Ham made me an atheist. When I looked into this, I basically learned that no matter what scientific discipline you start from, the evidence points overwhelmingly to a world that is very old, billions of years old to be specific. But in that class, I learned for myself how to measure the age of the universe by multiple means and realized that the universe was closer to 13.8 billion years old than to 6,000 years. I was taught that scientists lie about the age of the earth and lie about evolution because they're pawns of Satan who just want to live an accountability free life. Of it's a real scenario that hurts a lot of people. So what is the solution? Well, I'd say go to young earth creationists like Todd Wood or Marcus Ross that care about accurately representing the other side. Go to people that 
don't just care about making evolution look bad, or they don't just care about making them feel good. Maybe even check out what other evolutionists say to see what their position is, and look to see if there's good evidence for it. Don't just go to your atheist friend from work. Go to the experts on the subject, the ones that spend most of their time defending evolution. Maybe even the Christian evolutionists. Check them out. See what they actually think. And finally, let's try and keep organizations like Answers in Genesis accountable. Don't let people repeatedly misrepresent the data. Lovingly correct them. There are real consequences to this. Anyways, I hope you can see how dangerous organizations like Andrews and Genesis are. If you found this helpful, you can check out other videos I've done, along with my many interviews with Christian scholars, which show there are actually good reasons to think that mainstream science and the Bible don't actually contradict. Until next time, I'll see you guys later.